Cypher here. By now you might know my affinity for musicals. Yes, I'm a sucker for a good one. Sure, plenty are bad, but I'm willing to give a lot of leeway just to make the songs fit. And there's one that's been requested quite a bit. So Thomas K96, it's finally here. Let's talk about the 1972 musical that was just four years too early, 1776. 1972 was a crazy time in American history. The war in Vietnam was finally de-escalating, Nixon was re-elected in a landslide victory only a couple days prior to the release of this film, along with a strange scandal worrying people about a break-in at the Democratic Party's headquarters at some hotel named Watergate, the Pentagon Papers kept leaking more and more scandals, the Equal Rights Amendment was out for ratification, and this little musical seemed like it might give a welcome respite from the craziness the nation faced, thereby giving a sense of unity to the beleaguered citizenry. The Broadway musical from three years prior that this movie is based on certainly received praise for doing just that at the time. But of course, the press treated the film as something that promoted the status quo despite it being about a revolution. The reviews from the time were blatantly more about the author's beliefs in the current situation in America rather than the film itself. Remind you of anything? Anything movie reviewers deem overly patriotic becomes more of a mirror to their insecurities with the nation than about the movie itself. And the movie didn't do so great in theaters, but it's gotten some latter-day approval. Plus, it's just a great musical. Perhaps a little tame, and certainly well after the genre met its three decades long demise. But home video allowed us to pull this from its tomb. Given the subject is actually underserved in Hollywood, possibly to avoid all the kind of idiotic reviews films like this receive, this film may remain as one of the best portrayals about the Founding Fathers creating the Declaration of Independence. It's alright, just with a bunch of issues. Most of which I think can be easily forgiven thanks to the musical's surrealness. Now I've already made an episode about why the revolution came, and another about the historiography of the event. I'll just assume you guys are familiar with the general story, so we can just jump to talking about the film's portrayal. Historians have picked this film apart over the years, but that's because with enough time and scrutiny, scholars will find every blemish, especially when so many are dedicated to the subject. What will posterity think we were? Demigods? We're men, no more, no less. But the fact is, 1776 has some major redeeming qualities. The fact that they managed to really engage with the problems and ideology of declaring independence is fascinating. Every little thing is covered, like how some of the colonies didn't want to put their lot in with others. Don't you see that any colony who opposes independence will be forced to fight on the side of England? What the hell that we'll be setting brother against brother! That our new nation will carry as its emblem the mark of Cain! That one is particularly telling because South Carolina would be the first to secede in the Civil War. In fact, they cover the seeds of that conflict here too with an entire musical sequence, no less, about how the North is implicated in the barbarism of slavery simply by profiting off transporting and manufacturing the South's raw supplies. Molasses to rum to slaves Who sail the ships back to Boston Laden with gold, see it go Fortunes are made in the triangle trade. Hail slavery, the New England dream. Now that's some powerful stuff. We even see some more modern historiography addressed in this when they talk about how little Adams's complaints matter to the other colonies. You are merely an agitator, disturbing the peace creating disorder, endangering the public welfare. And for what? Your petty little personal complaints, your taxes are too high. And what is this independence of yours except the private grievance of Massachusetts 
Why is it always Boston that breaks the king's peace? This proposal is entirely his doing. Oh, it may bear Virginia's name, but it reeks of Adams, Adams, and more Adams. That's directly referencing the whole conservative revolution argument. Though the film falls too far when saying this. If I'm to hear myself called an Englishman, sir, I assure you I prefer I'd remain asleep. Oh, now what's so terrible about being called an Englishman? The English don't seem to mind. We've spawned a new race here, Mr. Dickinson. Rougher, simpler, more violent, more enterprising, less refined. We're a new nationality. We require a new nation. Most high schools still teach the orthodox view that Americans found a new national identity before 1776, but the last century of scholarship says otherwise. Standard high school curriculums are truly that far behind. Besides Ben Franklin himself, the rest of the founders proudly invoked the rights of Englishmen as though they were entitled to it. That was core to their argument for independence. In 1776, Americans did not feel a national identity. But I think the movie can be forgiven for having not read the Beards' interpretation or anything subsequent to that. Sure, they're half a century off from then-current interpretations, but most high school history teachers now are a century off. In terms of addressing new scholarship, though, the film really hits its mark when showing the perspective of non-elites. Oh, what are you talking about? You don't have to join up. You're in Congress. Well, you don't see them rushing off to get killed, do you? <laughs> sure, great ones for sending others, I can tell you that. A powerful trend in scholarship in the 1960s was history from the bottom up, and this is perfectly within what those historians were writing. It also alludes to what political bent made for that kind of history. But don't forget that most men with nothing would rather protect the possibility of becoming rich than face the reality of being poor. And that is why they will follow us to the right, never to the right, never to the left, forever to the right. Which is just a nice touch, though obviously the whole idea of leftism and rightism weren't things at that point in time. But interestingly enough, it's really the elites that this film gets egregiously incorrect. But I don't really think it's that bad. First, a lot of these guys are made into blithering idiots. Rhode Island passes. <laughs> the people want independence. The people have read Mr. Payne's Common Sense. I doubt very much Congress has. Well, they had read Common Sense, because it was foundational to the declaration they're all debating. But I get the joke. For instance, Richard Henry Lee here is a lovable goofball, without an ounce of wisdom. My name is Richard Henry Lee, Virginia is my home. My name is Richard Henry Lee, Virginia is my home. Now, what's the solution, I wonder? Get somebody else in Congress to propose. Oh, Richard, that's brilliant. Wasn't that brilliant, John? Brilliant. Yes. When in reality, he was noted for his aristocratic and intellectual manners. They also say he became governor of Virginia during this. Excuse me, but I must be returning to the sovereign colony of Virginia, as I have been asked to serve as governor. But that was his father years prior. But as the movie portrays correctly, the place was sweltering hot, they didn't open the windows for fear of letting spies hear, and they were constantly drunk. McNair, fetch two rum. Oh, I, I fear it's a little early in the day. Nonsense. It's a medicinal fact that rum gets a man's heart started in the morning. So maybe portraying them as blithering idiots isn't exactly so far off. Plus, what the film can't show is that we only know this stuff from recollections, not from minutes of the meetings or anything along those lines. So some flubbing is okay, but where it's really weird is John Dickinson, who's portrayed as being ardently against independence. Where do you stand on the question of independence? Treason. His delegation invokes property rights as his concern. In heaven's name, what's wrong with property? Perhaps you've forgotten that many of us first came to these shores in order to secure rights to property, and that we hold these rights no less dear than the rights you speak of. Well, no. He wasn't opposed to independence, just offensive warfare in order to achieve it, because he was a Quaker. That nuance is lost simply to make a villain out of him, and if I didn't have a half-century of hindsight, I'd probably be pretty angry with this film for that alone. 
Another major narrative problem is Jefferson's wife. She comes to Philadelphia from Virginia to satisfy Tom's lust. But life is more than sexual combustibility. Jefferson, stop right there. This is a crucial turning point in the movie, because once Jefferson gets his kicks, he gets over his writing block and finishes the declaration. Here's the problem, though. Martha Jefferson was pregnant at the time and never went to Philadelphia. That's just a strange addition for no reason. Especially when they get John Adams's relationship with his wife, Abigail, so correct. They even make a musical sequence out of quotes from their actual letters. Wow. But the film gets Adams wrong in the worst possible way. They constantly reinforce how maligned he is for being obnoxious. I'm obnoxious and disliked, you know that, sir. Yes, I know. That's just not backed up by primary sources. People wrote a lot about each other and mostly found him friendly. Our current perception of his abrasiveness comes from his time as president two decades later, where he's gone down as one of the worst of our presidents, though obviously not the worst. I think this is somewhat excusable, because he's actually kind of an amalgamated character. The film completely omits his cousin, Samuel Adams, who was also a delegate from Massachusetts, and that guy was certainly hot-headed. He was a leader of the Sons of Liberty, and noted for being burdensome on the topic of independence. John Adams even wears a ratty red coat throughout this, just like Samuel is known for. So just imagine that these are amalgamated characters, and the film becomes easier to deal with. The film does say this, and if Sam Adams can't put up with you, nobody can. But let's just pretend they didn't write themselves into a corner. Besides, I love the little things it manages to cram in there. Anyway, this is a revolution, damn it! We're going to have to offend somebody! Caesar Rodney arriving in the nick of time, despite having cancer, is awesome and true. Though, he was much younger than he's portrayed here. We get to see Ben Franklin arguing that turkeys should be our national bird. The turkey is a truly noble bird. Native American, source of sustenance of our original settlers, an incredibly brave fellow who will not flinch at attacking a regiment of Englishmen, single-handedly. Therefore, the national bird of America is going to be... The Eagle. The Eagle. Though he never argued for the adoption of the turkey, he did argue that it was a better symbol with that actual quote. In fact, Franklin's general quirkiness is well done here, even how he disowned his son. Yeah. Son, sir, what son? The royal governor of New Jersey, sir. As that title might suggest, sir, we are not in touch at the present time. I do have to point out some minor errors that bugged me, though. First is this. Because you neglected to tell us how saltpeter is made. By treating sodium nitrate with potassium chloride, of course. Why is he using scientific jargon from a century in the future when the actual words for those things are so much more intelligible? Then there's this. Madman? Landlord? Lawyer? They were both lawyers. Most of the delegates were. That's part of why politics is so terrible. They're mostly lawyers. If there's one thing America needs, it's more lawyers. Can you imagine a world without lawyers? Oh. And there's this. I mean, a ragtag collection of provincial militiamen who couldn't drill together, train together, or march together. But when a flock of ducks flew over, and they saw their first meal in three full days, sweet Jesus, could they shoot yeah. together. That's the myth that patriots were all backwoods hunters and therefore expert marksmen. Sure, there were a few, but the vast majority were far less disciplined and well-trained than their redcoat adversaries. And it really showed in battle. Patriot militias were often demeaned as being unfit for battle. So that's the movie pushing a myth. Finally, there's this. Connecticut, Mr. Roger Sherman. Pennsylvania. Delaware. Virginia, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Joseph Hughes. 
This is another American myth, but the Liberty Bell did not ring for the signing. The signing took place over the course of a month, so ringing the bell would be rather silly. I don't mind the time compression, but this is a standard part of the myth, and it just isn't factual. All in all, not really anything to be perturbed by. I've read a couple of historians getting all kinds of angry about this film, but honestly, I like it a lot. It has its problems, but it's a musical, so I'm a little extra lenient. And for those who are going to ask, yes, I'm working towards a Hamilton review. After all, that musical was written to complement this one. So I had to do this first. <laughs>